Hi. Well, well, you've had chance, I hope, just to browse this screen while, while we've been getting ready. But you can probably gather from this collection of reprobates here that the one in the white shirt with the epaulets is the pilot. <laughs> Which leads me on nicely to shape. Because what I'm going to talk about today is... is is landscape archaeology, how we go about it, how we do it, some projects I've worked on, how we can engage volunteers in, in learning to look about landscapes. And a lot of that relates to shape, recognising shapes and patterns. And what I also want to talk about is how those shapes have helped influence us. So I'm going to just reprise a little bit back to 1933 long before most of us were born. H.G. Wells wrote a book called The Shape of Things to Come. And in that book, he made reference to an aircraft called Crawford, a survey aircraft that was going to be used to hunt the mythical glider of Icarus. And this was in his vision of the shape of things to come. The Crawford that is being referred to of course, is Wells's friend and acolyte, O.G.S. Crawford, if anybody's ever heard of him, one of the most influential landscape archaeologists of the day. He recognised, after flying over the trenches in World War I, that aerial images, photographs taken from cameras in the air, could reveal archaeological sites. He could see the imprints of sites. He could see the crop marks. And he had this vision that things could be seen from the air, and they could help shape how we view things in the future. And it's interesting just to, to take a little um, quote from Crawford at this time, that when he was flying over and he looked down at the, the men in the trenches, and he said, these men were unable to see this, his place in the battle because they had the head in the trenches. They had no idea where they were or what context they were fighting in. That sounds awfully to me like a lot of people I see in trenches someday. Um, Phil's not in, is he? Uh, uh, keep, keep it, otherwise there'd be shrapnel heading towards me at this, at this point. The second most influential landscape archaeologist, in my opinion, uh, was a guy called W.G. Hoskins, who wrote a book called The Making of the English Landscape in the 1950s, first edition, I think. And he was one of the first people to actually start to use the idea that studying the past, you needed to look at old maps, you needed to look at the shapes of fields, you needed to look at aerial photographs, you needed to look at documents. In other words, the idea that you could get an idea of time depth by looking at lots of different things together, not just relying on one map, one hole in the ground, uh, and thank heavens he, he probably passed on long before geophysics had ever entered the uh, vocabulary. Hoskins likened landscape archaeology as being like a symphony, as his wonderful uh, vision that when you listen to a symphony, you hear individual sounds, you're hearing violins, you're hearing cellos, you're hearing pianos, but your brain is piecing it all together to help you enjoy the whole thing. And that's a little bit what landscape archaeology is all about. And the third most influential landscape archaeologist of this century, or the 20th century, I should say now, was, of course, Mick Aston. And what Mick Aston built on was those foundations provided by Hoskins and Crawford. They opened Mick's eyes. Mick has opened our eyes. And through Mick's um, academic work and his public work, what he did, as I said last night, that he opened our eyes and he made complex things very simple. He had a way of telling extremely complicated things in a way that was enjoyable and which was fun. Archaeology should be fun, um, as, as John has demonstrated quite ab admirably uh, earlier on. Because so many people listened to Mick through his broadcasts and his publications, he has helped shape things to come in a way and the vision that Wells had back in 1933. Because 
Not, ev not of, of all the millions of people who've listened to me, not every one of those will be an archaeologist or even want to be an archaeologist. But they will become teachers, they will become educators, they will become politicians, they will become TV presenters, God help us. Um, <laughs> They, they will, they, so en masse, will be able to shape the future from learning about the past. Uh, and, and from that um, foundation, in a way, where we come from in landscape archaeology is learning to piece things together and have this overview of the landscape, which, of course, you can find on any good map. Always, always have a map in front of you. Um, Understanding evidence in the landscape is about recognising shapes and patterns. Uh, and patterns are like the, it's like the handwriting of our ancestors. They leave their imprint on the landscape. And as landscape archaeologists, what we've got to do is learn to decode. We've got to learn that language. We've got to understand what that writing actually tells us. Uh, well, how do we do that? Well, to quote Mick Aston, we just simply go out and look. Now, depending on your experience, or anybody's experience, we will all see something different on that slide. If you're a geologist, you'll probably see cyclothems, and we all know what those are, don't we? If you're a botanist, you'll see meadows and moors. If you're a farmer, you'll see summer grazing and winter grazing. It depends on our experience range. If you're a landscape archaeologist, however, the one thing we will add into that is that a landscape archaeologist will see time depth in that image. And we'll see fields and walls, dispersed farmsteads, and importantly on this slide, we'll see earthworks. Earthworks. I'm going to say quite a lot about earthworks uh, in this particular session today. We see a landscape evolving through time. And learning to decode this handwriting is simply using your eyes to look at the evidence. We can see that there are patterns of field walls. Those patterns of field walls relate to parliamentary enclosure. We know what date they happened. These earthworks go underneath those walls. So are they earlier or later? They're older, aren't they? They're earlier. So already we can date those earthworks. They're going to be earlier than 1780 just by looking at them because they go under the field walls. It's actually fairly, fairly straightforward. And it is a bit like a landscape that's been written on and erased and written on and erased over three, four, five, ten thousand years of human activity. We've always got to keep that in our minds. That's what landscape archaeology is. We're seeing landscapes that have been changing. It's all that change and time. Why do people live here? Why do they settle here? It could be about resources. Uh, it could be about minerals. Any number of reasons. Geology, topography can influence where somebody lives and farms, but it could simply be there was somebody, there was something or somebody here before. And we have to keep that in our mind the whole time we think about time depth. What might appear in the first instance to be shapeless undulations in fields are trying to tell you something. They're crying out to be decoded. And using landscape archaeological techniques, this is how we will go about it, through three simple stages. The first is the go out and look stage. We're looking. The second is simply to look out how they relate to each other. Is there any stratigraphy? Does one set of earthworks overlie another? Does one set of pattern of fields? Does one shape overlie another? So you're looking at the layers. And thirdly, you compare what you see with other examples, you know, from elsewhere, where there might be dates that go with them. It's actually a very simple process. It's not very complicated. You don't need huge amounts of expensive kit or huge amounts of mechanical diggers or huge teams of excavators. You can just do it by going out and looking. 
won't we just simply have to learn how to look? This is a really good example of the problems of people trying to understand archaeology where the archaeology is in here, the stratigraphy of the earthworks, all telling a story, and they're all standing on top of it. Can't see stuff when you're standing on top of it. Always walk around it. Look at it from the outside inwards. And the brain, train your brain to see what you see at that angle, to transfer it to above. In other words, try to view a landscape as if you're looking at down the map. That's how you have to think the whole time. That evidence will be there for you to decode. Think of earthworks as being like um, an ailment that you might have. You wake up one morning, probably some of you did this morning, and feel a bit rough. Um, but you might, you might have a sore throat. You might have... A bit tender up there. You're not feeling, you're feeling under weather. When you go, you go and see your GP. The GP, the first thing the GP isn't going to do is take you, lie you down, and cut you open to find out what's wrong. Not going to excavate you, is he? I hope not. Anyway, the GP isn't immediately going to slide you into an MRI scanner. The GP is just going to simply assess the symptoms in a general sort of way to see what your, might feel your swellings, you know, have a look in your mouth, might ask you whether you smoke or drink, make an assessment of the evidence that's all around. If then it decides, or she decides, hmm, young man, you've got mumps. You don't question that diagnosis, oh no, I want to be cut open. I'll only know if I'm cut up open. I'll only know if you get some evidence. You, you accept that diagnosis because the GP's seen it a thousand times before. Again, that's what landscape archaeology is about. You're diagnosing the landscape. You're looking at the symptoms. And think of it, again, think of it in that sort of order. Now, going out and looking is fine when you can get out in the landscape. But what I'm going to talk about a little bit now is about how there is another way of looking which helps us understand all these lumps and bumps and patterns and shapes and it's called LIDAR which stands for light detection and raging it's an acronym like radar and this is going to be the kind of one minute version of how LIDAR works so if there's any scientists here you have to bear with me it has to be quick aeroplane flies over the ground got a laser scanner in it 150,000 pulses a second it scans along as it goes. Every one of those pulses, because we know the speed of light, you can measure how long it takes to go from the point from which it was emitted, so you know how far it is from the aircraft. All that data has a timestamp, which collects data from GPS satellites, compares it to a differential correction. So within a matter of seconds, you have a three-dimensional coordinate of everything that the pool sits on the ground, including all the details on your credit card. <laughs> and that has an accuracy down to centimetres. Now, yeah? centimetres. So what you can do then is use that point cloud data, it's called, model it into three-dimensional computer software, and out of it, you get wonderful LiDAR images of what the ground looks like. I suspect that looks like crap <laughs> on here. So basically, we have a tool which allows us to see all the lumps and bumps on the ground as well as going out and looking. Did that make any sense at all? Oh, good, good. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> what I'm going to move on to here is, is, is talk about how being able to use that LIDAR as a tool for landscape archaeology to help us analyse patterns, help us understand something about the development of the landscape. And the area, Penrith is, uh, is here, Carlisle up there, Newcastle up there, huge block of moorland. 
and it's going to, I'm going to bring it up to date, but it, the story starts in 2008 when I worked for English Heritage. Uh, and I was asked to design a research project which would help us understand the relationship between past environments and pollution, because this is a lead, a lead area. And uh, to historic problems with lead pollution, trying to see if archaeology could help us understand more about the natural environment and how toxicity got into soils. That's how it started out. Uh, and in those days, we didn't have freely available LIDAR. It had to be commissioned. We had to spend a lot of money actually getting LIDAR produced for 50 square kilometres of landscape. In the centre of that landscape, that 50 square kilometres, there were five, only five archaeological sites that you would probably understand as archaeological sites in the record, only five in 50 square kms. There were hundreds of sites in the record which related to 19th and 18th century lead mining. So this place was viewed as a wilderness, basically. In the centre of this wilderness area was a Roman fort. Its Roman name is Epiarchum, modern name Whitley Castle, which we'll come back later to. You can see on the slide, it is absolutely it's a stunning Roman fort. I've described it as the best preserved Roman fort in the Western Empire. Now, don't say that lightly. Now, don't say that lightly, because the levels of preservation of the earthworks, the scale of the earthworks, and the preservation of time depth within it, I have not seen paralleled anywhere else on all the Roman forts I've seen, and I've seen and ignored quite a lot over my life. It, you can't see on this, because this is a, an image taken from an aircraft or a drone looking like that. It is a perfect diamond shape. It is the only one in the Roman Empire which is a perfect diamond shape. There are a number of unique things. It's got the most ramparts of any Roman fort, and they're perfectly preserved. But it's sitting in the middle of a wilderness, presumably there to police the collection of, of lead which was a mineral the Romans needed in great quantities. But I'm not going to talk about Epiarchum, because it just happens to be there. can't believe how bad the resolution is on these slides and how wonderful the information is that I'm trying to com convey to you. Because you can't, I'm going to say, ignore the Roman fort, which is the best advice I can ever give anybody in my life. Just ignore <laughs> the Roman fort, because what you can see here, of course you can see it, can't you? Uh, you can't see it at all on here. There are lots of patterns and shapes of other earthworks. Ignore all this. This is all Roman fort stuff. There are patterns of shapes which tell us that there are other things there before the Romans ever got here to confuse the story. And this is LIDAR here. You can, see, can you see that shape? You see round things and courtyards and round houses. LIDAR, to, to, things to show on LIDAR, you have to be able to see them above ground, just like our eyes do. Isn't that clever? But once you've got the data, you can process it in different ways. You can filter it, you can exaggerate it. So earthworks such as that high, you can stretch inside a computer. Um, again, you can probably see the outline of it on there. That isn't an outline, that is an earthwork which is that high. I used to take groups of people and used to have picnics in a an Iron Age roundhouse. This is a settlement typical of the Roman Iron Age here. And that led to finding 23 other Roman period settlements within five miles of that Roman fort, all in extremely high levels of preservation because they've never been plowed down in the medieval period. So we have earthworks standing this high. Here at Gossip Gate. Can you see that at all? It's a collection. There are 33 roundhouses in one settlement with a lane going through it called Gossip Gate. Again, Yat, Norse Yat, it's a, it's a way. And Gossip Gate, a track where people with a spiritual affinity could walk. That's the origin of Gossip Gate as, as a name. It's got layers of earthworks in it. The roundhouses of the Roman period, the Roman Iron Age period, are overlain by small rectangular and both-sided buildings. 
you can see them laid because they're in different patterns over the top of some of these houses along the street. This is going to be evidence of continuity of settlement after the Roman period into that period we often refer to as the Dark Ages, the 6th, 7th, 8th, the missing centuries, they call. The evidence is sitting there on the surface, not a geophysicist to be seen. Here's, here's another one, a short distance away. Massive earthworks, and you can see individual roundhouse platforms, steps down, step down the landscape. I know that uh, there are three, there are three people here who keep looking at me and laughing because they were with me a few, a couple of weeks ago, actually on these sites. Yeah, <laughs> that's why I didn't give you it. That's absolutely right. But it's, uh, again, you can see the preservation levels of these on the surface. The earthworks are enormous. But this, you could have easily spotted the pattern change, the shape, by just looking at the Ordnance Survey map where all the walls are pretty straight. And then you come down here and the wall goes whoop. Because the wall is going round something that's already there. It will, tell, it will tell you immediately that pattern of walls, there's something odd going on there. And that would have led you to the site. Very simply, without the, the LIDAR. Here's another one, which, in other words, it, 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 it seemed at first just a, a, another one of these Roman Iron Age settlements. A smaller one, two round houses and compounds, but crucially, one of the boundaries of this courtyard complex overlied a very big linear earthwork, which you'll probably just see going along there, which tells us that. That linear earthwork is older than that settlement. So that is pre-Roman Iron Age. And these boundaries can be traced for miles around this landscape. There's linear dikes going around the landscape, dividing this landscape up into effectively estates during the, the Bronze Age period. Crucially, even right through to the medieval period, these boundaries retained legal status between the meadows of the summer pasture and the moorlands, sorry, the, the, the moorlands that are used for summer pasture and the grasslands and meadows which are used for winter grazing. They still had legal resonance right through into the medieval and later period, even though by then they had no idea what the, where these things came from. One here, this is a 3D LiDAR image, where you've got differential land use on either side of a wall. Ploughed down in here, but you can still see the shape of it and the, the courtyards inside it. On the other side, where it hasn't been ploughed, you've got prehistoric walling standing. You can see the height of Dave on there, standing up to that height, still surviving, just on the other side, edge of the wall. You could easily walk through this field, look at the lumps and bumps, look over the top and see the walls, how it used to look. This is all still surviving by... Using LIDAR, common sense, and going out and looking. Mick Aston often used to say the best archaeological sites are discovered when you just pop around the, pop around the corner to have a pee out of the way. And you, you go away and, oh, what's that? Um, it's just, it's simple. It's looking and analysing what you see. Here's a, a further site, only just further down the valley from the last one. This is a henge. We saw it as a henge, we interpreted it as a henge, because a henge, and the curving feature has got crucial uh, element, is that the ditch is on the inside of the bank, in most, like most scenarios for henges. The bank is on the outside, the ditch is on the inside. And this has got two concentric banks and ditches. And when you look at the earthworks, which are perfectly well preserved, you can see inside the central, Henge is an Iron Age courtyard settlement like the other ones we see. So in the Iron Age, people are living inside something that they could already see and already use. And crucially, we took uh, did an excavation up here uh, with an uh, altogether archaeology group. Through the ditch got lovely radiocarbon date ranges, which place it about the same time as Sea Henge. So we've got the date in, we've got the fabric of a henge in this landscape. In a landscape, the whole of the North Pennines, where no henge 
has been discovered before. And crucially in the excavations, no evidence of anything else, settlement or divisions or anything else. This is a, a wonderful example of something that survived and is as complicated as the Thornborough Henges in Yorkshire. Just again, surviving on the surface. Now, that was the English Heritage Project and that was some of the highlights from it. But what it made me realise as I came to my, my retirement bell ringing, that this was an incredibly useful way of engaging people in landscapes to use LIDAR and field work together. How, how could, it's quite easy to get people to come on digs for some strange reason, people like digging. I will never work it out, I hate it. I will, I never work, but people do like doing it. So how do I get people to like doing landscape archaeology? Um, there are many ways, you can look at maps, you can colour them in, that's one way of doing it. You can use LIDAR. Um, but what I learned from doing that project was that I could, I felt I could structure a project which used all the LIDAR that's now available through the Environment Agency freely to look at all the other valleys in the North Pennines, the, the Derwent, the Tees and Weirdale and devise a recording methodology where you could do it. You could, you could do these make the same discoveries that we've been making. And together with the North Pennines Air and B Partnership, the Altogether Archaeology Group, the Heritage Lottery Fund, and my University at Chester, we put together a project so that volunteers could discover archaeological sites. Now it's perhaps a pottery, but archaeological sites. And just to give you an idea how much ground we covered in that pro this was the first phase, the yellow phase, and then we moved on to the other major valleys. We've done 860 square kilometres of landscape recording with this methodology I'm going to briefly go through. That's a lot of landscape. When I do stuff, I don't do small. I do big. I do big. And this is just an example of how that recording methodology works. Um, I call this my glass of wine archaeology um, because you can sit and do this at home with your glass of wine uh, and in my experience you see more archaeology with red than white but you know, <laughs> eh, we all have our preferences don't we but basically what I did was process the LIDAR data into imagery that your, your brain can understand because it, like it looks like a photograph, it isn't it's, it's that three-dimensional data and because it's showing all the earthworks, what we did is set up a series of workshops to show people how to recognise shapes and patterns. The instructions are really quite simple. If it looks something odd about it, record it. And they would record it on these sheets which were um, sent out to them digitally and would put, put all the, they'd send the data back to me put all this data onto an enormous spreadsheet and record it all, put it through the sort of standards that uh, the historic environment records demand, get them working with historic maps that are online to see what was there before. But you can see all the volunteers are doing is just marking things out with shapes. And I wanted people to use language that we all understood. It's curvy, it's square, it's round. Well, that's straight and then it's got a funny kick. I didn't want people to suddenly say, oh, it's something from the 4th century AD. I think, because you can't do that. You can't do that at the beginning. You have to do shape recognition and pattern recognition. Those fingerprints. And this is the, the yellow area at the top. And to give you a quick summary, we recorded 1,027 new archaeological sites in that area from a base of zero in there. 43 of those were prehistoric and Roman sites. These are sites all surviving above ground with earthworks and stoneworks attached to them which in an area where there were none in that particular area is a pretty good start, 43. So instead of thinking of this, world, this landscape around Epi Arkham as being a wilderness with, oh, with Romans in it, isn't that exciting? Nonsense. This was populated with people, with animals, with industry, all around this Roman fort. 
being sucked into Hadrian's Wall economy, no doubt. I prefer to use the word Hadrian rather than Hadrian's Wall because it's drained the life out of, of landscapes. It's drained resources out of real archaeology into that god-awful wall that goes across it. In that yellow area, sites now, not found now by professionals, uh, as we did in the English Heritage Project, these are now found by volunteers, the, the next group of sites I'm going to show you. Because, again, the slide issue, can you see that really big curving feature? There. I know it's there, it's on, on the imagery, it's stunning, absolutely stunning. Big curving feature in the landscape. Here, visible as an earthwork. Here's the survey of it. Elliptical earthwork, coming back round here, entrance at the top. It's another henge. Huge henge. It's one of the biggest henges around. That's surviving differential land use. It's overplowed by medieval ridge and furrow. You can tell it's pre-medieval in date before you even start. Because the patterns of medieval ridge and furrow go over the top of it. So there's another. So that's now two henges in the North Pennines area from a base of none. And if you ever if you ever read Aubrey Burles henges and look at studies of henges, the North Pennines has got this huge gap in it because there are no henges. Yes, there are. There are two. And there, as Francis said earlier on, there will be more. Because once you know where two are in relation to the river valleys, you can start to predict where the other ones would be, about patterns of movement across the landscape. Another site, again, just to show you, there are more and more of these Roman Iron Age sites all through this landscape, surviving of earthworks for their fields and trackways and roadways. That whole infrastructure of prehistoric landscape is preserved above ground in this area. It is quite remarkable. You can see this series of fields on here, these field terraces. There are two settlements joined together and where this toll road has crashed through it, you can see the remains of lots of roundhouses there as well. Or again, you could go, we could all go out for a picnic and have a, almost have a house each and, and have a picnic in, in, a, in a Roman round or Roman period, Iron Age roundhouse. It's really, really rather remarkable. The most remarkable thing, of course, is they're found by volunteers, not by me. This is a, a, an absolute wonderful site. I want to whet Francis' appetite a bit here because this is set, the pattern of this one. Can you see it? Double, double, I'm not going to use the word ramparts loosely, double banked enclosure. It's on a steep slope and the double, double banks come round here, Francis, round and stop here. And in here is this most marvellous bog and spring. It comes, it's like a crab, it comes and grabs this, this spring. And there is a lump in the middle and that's an intact cairn, a mound. That's a, a very large burial mound that's sitting in the centre of it. This is a, a phenomenal early piece of archaeology surviving because at the bottom here where you get contact between these field boundaries, these field boundaries are Roman Iron Age. These field boundaries go over the top of these earthworks so this is going to be earlier than the Roman Iron Age. This is probably Bronze Age at the latest, I suspect, and it's capturing a natural spring here. And it sits at the junction of two major river valleys, exactly the sort of place you'd expect ceremony, ritual in, of the sort that, that Francis was describing earlier on. Remarkable find, that one. And lastly, not to ignore, I focused a bit on that Roman uh, Iron Age period simply to show you that there's so much out there. I can't talk about everything. I had to select something to illustrate the points. But whole new landscapes have emerged out of this through the volunteer uh, recording process. And you won't see these at all on, on the slides, I'm afraid, but huge swathes of small fields, clearly overlapping each other, phasing and change. And associated with them are often two-roomed buildings. And we mapped acres and acres and acres of these in different colours, different phases, different types of ploughing. 
and it revealed a whole raft of landscape features which are associated with the movement of agriculture from the lower ground into the higher ground before enclosure. They're probably late 15th, 16th century before the period of, of the unification of the crowns, in fact. Uh, and none of these have been recorded or analysed before. Huge areas of them. And, and to the point where once you've seen one out in, on the ground, it's patterned in the LIDAR, you can pick up on the landscapes that have then been enclosed with all these walls and you see these little curvy things still surviving in the middle, replicating these field systems of the earlier days which have been kind of lost within that later enclosure. And finally, we, we put all that into a report, and that's available online, uh, which sums up how the volunteers got involved, what the methodology was, and what they, what they actually found. And the report for the final three areas is, is in progress. Paul Foxham's writing that side of, of those at the moment. We will have over 2,000 new sites that volunteers have found. Imagine the thrill of finding a hinge, the thrill of finding a house on the surface that collapsed 2,000 years ago. And you're the first person to see that and recognise it just from its patterns and just from, it's there, I can see it, it's out in front of me. We've covered 860 square kilometres and to sort of round up the, the prehistoric and Roman Iron Age period, there are now 94 prehistoric the Roman period sites in those areas. From having a, a base of five to start with, the completely the volunteer programs completely revolutionised the, the kind of academic understanding of that landscape. It's incredible how the contribution of volunteers, what they can make into archaeology. A bit like the star, the, there was a star spotting exercise years ago, wasn't there? Where people were asked to spot stars in the in the sky and record them. This is a similar sort of process. You can do it at home. You can actually identify your own elements of landscape just by looking at patterns. Now, a little bit conscious of time, so I'll, I'll wrap up as soon as I, I can now, Tony. Um, of course, when you do something, it's a good example of how you start off with one set of objectives to look at historic lead mining and work out where the, where the um, toxic debris lies on the surface and see if you can identify that using archaeological techniques. And that's, a, that's why you start, why we started out here, and whether you can use LIDAR to help understand that. And you end up completely revolutionising the understanding of a huge chunk of northern Britain, of upland Britain. It's a bit like Carenza was illustrating yesterday for those that were here. Started off digging test pits in village, but suddenly all new ideas start to, to scream out and you, you follow them all over the... And suddenly you've got a huge understanding of, of you know, large tracts of Cambridgeshire that, that uh, uh, Carenza was talking about. Here we've got complete new understanding about the North Pennines. But this is, is kind of where I want to, to, to finish in a way because that has now led me on to another element of, of public engagement that um, I'm developing at the moment because the, the recording phase of that project is essentially now finished and it's generated so much information you can't, you just simply can't let that information go. It's in the public record, reports are published, it's what's been done already is on the historic environment record so anybody can access that information. But one of the things that, that's always stimulated me about um, archaeology, and well, I'm still I'm passionate about using maps and finding things and, and, and exploring the countryside and all that, it, is that it is so simple to do. The processing LIDAR is not complicated, the instructions are available on the web how you can do it. If anybody wants to know, talk about it later on, I can point you to the sites that will help. It can be done, it's very easy to do. But it's great for like me and Francis and Tony we can go out, we can wander these landscapes. We, we, we're, we're still mobile, we're still, we're, we can still got the energy to go out there. There are lots of people who can't do that, physically can't do it, through disability, um, walking problems, whatever. But there's a whole raft of disability and access, which I think is denied to uh, lots, lots of sections of our communities. That, that's disenfranchised groups. There are lots of people with social disabilities. 
There are lots of people with mental health issues. There are lots of um, audiences that I want to be able to understand the excitement I get from finding sites like that and the excitement I know my volunteer groups got from finding those sites. We want to be able to take them to these sites. Now it's dead easy, we could all go out and have a wander around the countryside, but lots of people can't do that. Um, so what I'm doing now, I'm setting up a new project which is bringing together three universities, Chester, York and, and John Moores at Liverpool, with, with their um, UAV research unit there. And we're fo refocusing back on where we started, at Whitley Castle, to develop uh, what's called a research landscape. So, um, I'm sure people are here have heard of Vindolanda and the conservation, you know, the tablets and the, and the excavation. This is going to be the non-invasive um, non Vindolanda. With the Epi Arkham Trust, what I'm developing is a non-invasive research landscape because all the remains there are above ground. They can be looked at, we can do survey, we can take people around. Again, that's great if you can get there. But as well as all the research you want to do there, using new remote sensing techniques, such as LiDAR, which you can now mount on drones, you can do LiDAR from drones. John was talking about drones being more and more effective now. Because all the data we've captured, and intend to capture a lot more of in this landscape, is 3D digital data. You can now look at landscapes in a different way. You just don't have to nip round the corners, have a pee to find something. We can see it and replicate it in three dimensions through virtual reality and augmented reality systems. Uh, we're, we're going to do sound recording at different parts of the site. So if you have hearing disabilities and hearing disabilities at different frequencies, you can go onto that site and you can hear the site. Because wind moves through rushes and it moves through trees and it moves over the ground in different sounds. Imagine if, you, if you've got limited hearing ability and you can hear and have frequencies which replicate the noises of wind going through the rushes and you're in this lovely moorland fringe landscape. So what we're doing is using all these 3D data, bringing them together and capturing them to create the opportunities for people who can't experience the world that, like we experience it, that they can experience some of the thrill and some of the enjoyment we get from it in, in new virtual ways. And we're going to do, I'm sorry to have to say this, and this is embarrassing, but we are going to do some more geophysics up there. Uh, I just don't know anybody who's good enough to do it. <laughs> um, and if anybody wants to be involved with this, this project, that locally or from around the country, for instance. This project will, uh, at the moment, it's in its final stage of development, be launched probably next year. Um, but the, I know from the water logging and the work we've done here that the water logging levels at Epi Arkham are consistent with the water logging levels known at Vindolanda. And, and these are earthworks which haven't been disturbed in any meaningful way. So the opportunities for recovery of information in the long-term future is good. And any excavation we do there will be targeted against research questions at the end of doing the non-invasive work. Going back to the body, we're not going to start digging the body up first. We're going to go and see whether it's got mumps first. Uh, and just to the final, final statement, I've talked about Romans and I've talked about the Roman Iron Age and what you can do by, uh, find by using landscape archaeology techniques. We did, in fact, find a Mott and Bailey Castle sitting there and recognised as well, with a designed landscape around it of the 13th, early 14th century. In, in this, what's this wilderness? It's wilderness nonsense. It's only a wilderness because nobody could be asked to go and look at it because they'd all been sucked up to Hadrian's Wall. <laughs> And on that happy note, you go away thinking, hey, drains wall. Just keep saying, hey, drains wall. Hey, drains archaeology, full stop. Thank you. <laughs>